Most people think that narrative is like a river that flows swift and sure in one direction, from beginning to middle to ending in predictable procession. But I have seen the face of narrative, and I can tell you they're wrong. Narrative is an ocean in a storm, with its only constant being the writer's desire to tell an enthralling story. You may wonder who I am, or why I say this. Sit down, and I will tell you a tale, laying out the intriguing possibilities of non-linear narrative. Know first that I am the artful narrator, and that it is my privilege to welcome you to learning the tropes of writing. Please forgive this brief flight of fancy, good storytellers, but the opening to Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time, is one of my all-time favorites, and I simply could not resist making homage to it. Wait, wait, wait. That's not how it happened. There are many facets to consider when crafting your story, from characters to themes and the tone of the tale. However, one valuable tool you may not have taken into account is the linearity of the narrative. What do I mean by that? Well, a classic example is the approach of starting a story and medias res. Now, story structure normally follows the three-act formula. The players are introduced, the problem is established, and the players overcome the problem. However, a story which starts in medias res, which translated from the Latin is into the middle of things, means that the story can start in the midst of the drama getting the audience right into the action for a taste of what is to come. This is a different kind of superhero story. To tell it right, we gotta take you back before I squeeze this ass in spandex. Before flashing back to the beginning of the adventure to show what events led up to the conflict and thus allow the audience a chance to get to know the characters more personally. Oh yeah. Such changes to the timeline of the narrative are powerful tools for shaping the way the audience experiences the story. Now, in talking about nonlinear narrative, one would be a fool not to mention the immensely superb film Memento. But be warned, if you are someone who appreciates brilliantly crafted narrative and have yet to see this movie, I highly suggest that you watch the film before continuing, as there will be minor spoilers ahead. Spoilers! The film opens at the end of the story, with the death of Teddy, and then proceeds to slowly fill in the story that led up to the death, one short clip at a time. For you see, Leonard the protagonist suffers from anterograde amnesia, meaning that he is unable to form new memories, and thus must try to piece together events from notes he has left for himself. And yet, with nothing but his notes and photographs to guide him, there is a very real suspicion that someone might be manipulating Leonard. The effect of the narrative's presentation is that you, as the viewer, find yourself suspicious of everyone the protagonist meets, because, through the masterful editing and pacing, you, like Leonard, are unaware of the events leading up to the present situation. Intercut between this story moving in reverse is a series of scenes of Leonard in his motel room, recounting the apropos story of Sammy Jenkins to an unnamed man on the phone. These scenes, differentiated by being shaded in a noir or black and white, slowly progress forward while the other story reaches backward until they both meet, forming a perfect loop and finally revealing the full story to the viewer. Yeah. We all need mirrors to remind ourselves who we are. I'm no different. The result was a truly innovative and unique experience, and honestly, one of my most memorable movie-going moments. Now, where was I? Now, to fully appreciate our next entry, we must first give thought to an occasional problem in superhero stories. For, while we wish to see the hero's origin so that we can sympathize and connect with him, we also are anxious to see him finally get suited up in all his spandex glory so that he can start duking it out with evildoers. Not bad for somebody who never took a sewing class. However, the TV series enigmatically titled Arrow 
addresses this problem through what is perhaps the best usage of flashbacks that I have ever seen. 4. The series opens with Oliver Queen returning from the island as a deadly bowmaster, ready to seek vengeance on those who failed his city. Yet, the narrative strategically gives us flashbacks, showing Oliver's slow transformation from spoiled rich kid to capable vigilante during his time on the island. Furthermore, the reason this works so well is that the narrative does not portray Oliver himself as having these flashbacks, but it is rather the narrative itself which is jumping between the two timelines, which ultimately succeeds in giving us the best of both worlds. A story with a well-paced portrayal of the hero's journey, while at the same time not making us wait to be able to enjoy the visceral action of the arrow's exploits. The island held many dangers. To live, I had to make myself more than what I was. To forge myself into a weapon, I am returning. Not the boy who was shipwrecked, but the man who will bring justice to those who have poisoned my city. My name is Oliver Queen. And in another example of the clever resequencing of narrative chronology, we have the Ocean's Eleven series of films. In this title, depicting charismatic con men and elaborate heists, the narrative is presented to us in a staggered format, whereby the scenes depicting the planning of the heist are intercut with the actual execution of the early stages of the intricate cons, which ultimately proves to be a masterful feat of cinema wherein the con men manage to con not only their intended victim, but the audience as well. For by presenting the planning scenes in such a way that the full scope of Danny Ocean's design remains hidden from the audience, the narrative allows the viewer to believe that something has gone horribly awry, which supplies the necessary drama to keep the tension high, while in the end allowing our huckster heroes to look like the masterminds that they truly are, for having pulled off so perfect a deception. Play long enough, you never change the stakes, the house takes you. Unless, when that perfect hand comes along, you bet big, and then you take the house. You've been practicing this speech, haven't you? A little bit, did I rush it? Felt like I rushed it. No, it's good, I liked it. Now it is true that one should not use nonlinear narrative frivolously, nor without consideration for the way it alters the perception of the narrative. For, if used poorly, it can compromise the quality of the story by replacing clarity with confusion. However, as the examples listed above attest, it can also elevate the plot by weaving dynamic style with rich substance to create entirely new narrative possibilities. So, having heard tell of but a scarce few of the strange and innovative ways that you can use nonlinear narrative, what say you? Will you dare to try employing it in your own stories? Well, I'll think it over. I'll talk it over with my mustache. If nothing else, I hope this video has expanded your narrative horizons. For people assume that narrative is a strict progression of cause to effect, when actually, from a non-linear, non-subjective viewpoint, it's more like a big ball of wibbly-wobbly, narrative-y, narrative -y stuff. I'd, I'd no idea where he picks that stuff up. Thank you very much for watching. I hope that this video has been informative, or at the very least, a pleasant diversion. Until next time.